As the situation of the corporate state empire becomes more desperate, <clears throat> they will attempt to retain control through desperate measures. One of these possible methods to look out for would be state-sanctioned looting, or rather state-sanctioned robbery, which would essentially consist of uh, not necessarily state forces, but rather uh, various armed groups organizationally who would be paid through a percentage of whatever they might loot. And the uh, cut, I suppose you could say, would go to the state in order to support the state monopoly franchise, which is essentially uh, extorted it, based off of threats and extortion and whatnot. Obviously, most of the areas that would be prime targets for such activities would be those areas that have the most valuable uh, materials to be uh, taken and the least amount of resistance, so probably like woke posh areas, that sort of thing. And uh, it would consist of armed groups essentially going in and cleaning out somebody's house or whatnot, just taking all of their valuables, which would be different in an organizational scope to the idea of the petty theft looting from like homeless populations or Antifa and BLM, that type of stuff. So this would be more organized. It would be more akin to uh, mercenary forces, which are funded through the promise of keeping what they steal uh, through, through a force of arms, uh, coercion, threat, that type of thing. And then, of course, a cut going to the people who are sanctioning it. So who would sanction these sorts of activities? Well, it would be, of course, the state, but specific individuals within the state structure would do it. And those would be your councils, your committees, the actual individuals that hide behind and run these uh, structures. And on those councils and committees, you can usually find the general culprits. You have uh, professors, PhDs, that sort of um, position. You have politicians, of course, senators and representatives and whatnot. You'll have judges and lawyers and people in that sphere. And then, of course, you'll have upper echelon police chiefs and uh, marshals and things like that. And then naturally, the last one will be clerics, priests, that sort of thing. An example of this can be found with the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board, a document from August 19th, 2019, The Meeting Summary. This Community Police Advisory Board, your, uh, <clears throat> your operatives that run the state empire monopoly, corporate state empire monopoly, uh, here in this document you have the list of the members, which as stated before, consists of commissioner uh, or chair of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, a Ohio House representative, this is from Ohio, a Cleveland State University Associate Professor of Urban Studies and Interim Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, University of Cincinnati Professor of Criminal Justice and Director of IACP slash UC Center of Police Research and Policy, Columbus Police Department and member of Fraternal Order of Police, Medina County Sheriff's Office and member of the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association, Ohio Attorney General's Office, Pastor and Serve Project Director, Stark County Prosecutor's Office, Oregon Police Department and member of the Ohio Association of Chiefs of Police, Franklin County Prosecutor, uh, then you have Ohio Senate, Ohio House, you have the Ohio Conference Units of NAACP, a former Ohio Senator and President, a uh, former member of Congress, former U.S. Senator, Governor of Ohio, and Mayor of Cleveland. So yeah, as stated before, you have those, essentially those four roles that you'll find in these state-run conglomerates, these boards and committees that would sanction such an activity in order to keep what they believe to be their 
rightful control over the community because when they run out of funds and when they run out of things to pay their thugs and all that well they need a way to generate more capital more revenue so that they can keep their structure and system afloat this took place in the past already in many ways and in many circumstances but is most apparent with the religious wars of the 17th century in which you had large armies of armed mercenaries or rather bandits who would go around pillaging different areas and that was their payment the state sanctioned pillaging and looting was how they raised funds for their activities this was done under the guise of catholic versus protestant the idea of religious fervor in which both sides are equally controlled but essentially they argue and fight each other but really it's just a covers for them to go and pillage and rob and destroy things and the same sort of idea was visualized in the gangs of new york movie in which you did have the protestant nativist um versus like the globalist catholics that was the, that's the uh, label for the two groups anyway of course this is also president in the communist versus capitalist which is uh the same example of two sides uh, fighting for the same purpose uh simply uh giving a cover of conflict between two equally controlled groups. Then you had the same idea with the Blue Lives Matter versus the Black Lives Matter, where both sides will achieve the same ends of supporting the tyrannical corporate state empire structure. Either way, the people who are not part of their little clubs and organizing groups lose. This also, we get an example of the maneuver to religious fervor with the Venetian Republic, where two priests being incarcerated or arrested for violating the laws of the state, the uh, papacy and uh, that religious structure gets involved and changes the narrative to one of religious persecution rather than um, holding accountable a criminal. Now, the state empire is founded upon, practically speaking, the municipal corporations. They form the building blocks that construct the sort of um, state fortress, if you will, of commercial control, among other things. And, and the revenue comes from the municipal to the state and so in a sense it is a state made of many cities rather than a state made of one city state so they're cities a state of cities uh, we can find an example of this in the code for the town of carefree arizona under d it states payment of all fees, fines, penalties, forfeitures, and other monies collected by the court to the treasurer and payment of all surcharges levied thereon by the state to the state treasurer as required by law. So there you go. The municipal supports the state. They are the founding uh, structure that keeps the state operating. And if the municipal goes down, then the, well, then the state goes down too. And so the municipal uh, in conjunction with the state, they have to keep their hierarchical structure and flow of revenue. Now, the elements of conquest that have to do with the monetary system, uh, an example or explanation can be found in the video game Kingdom Come Deliverance, in which uh, silver mines are taken over by bandits for the purpose of making counterfeit money, where inferior metal is plated with silver to look like the legitimate and then mixed in with the legitimate mint money but under value or with less value and so it crashes the currency and the economy because things of inferior value are being traded for things of superior value and thus you have the monopoly money that we use today to pay for everything our enforced uh, counterfeit currency 
that we have to use, which is not um, legitimate currency. And that's the reason why we have such a drastic uh, economic depression and um, have been in a bad economic state for a long time. Some explanation for this can be found in Levantine Adventure, The Travels and Missions, The Chevalier d'Arvoux, 1653 to 1697 by Warren H. Lewis. Chapter 1, page 11, it states, Insurance and freight must have been heavy, for Postia carried valuable cargo. Merchandise worth 25,000 livres, or pounds sterling, and 25,000 in cash. To say nothing of the passengers' money and of the trade goods of the officers and crew, Cash and bullion, of course, still travel about the world, but not under the conditions which in the earlier part of the 17th century made them the chief French export to the Levant. For some reason, perhaps because business over the Asian trade routes was largely conducted by barter, the Ottoman Empire minted remarkably little coin, but the barter system could not be used between Frank and Turk because French exports to Turkey were insufficient to pay for their imports from the Levant, and the trade could be balanced only by the French exporting cash to pay for their purchases. This state of affairs did not embarrass the French export of cash, for the sale of his return cargoes to Western markets more than recouped him for the cash exported. But it was a constant worry to Colbert and his successors who held that the process was draining away the wealth of France. Already the export of cash had been prohibited, but to conduct the Levant trade on any other basis in the then infant stage of French manufacturers proved impossible, and the wholesale evasion of the edict was winked at. It was not until 1682, when French factories were turning out export goods in large quantities, that a new edict making it illegal to export more than a third of a ship's laden in cash was strictly enforced. No doubt much of Postillon's cash consisted of five sole pieces, a penny, whose manufacture expressly for export to the Levant was a profitable sideline for the French mint. For the general dearth of cash, the Turk was glad to buy them for seven and a half souls. But unfortunately, this traffic had a boomerang effect, Coiners manufactured and exported base five sole bits, many of which found their way back to Marseille, where by 1666 the quantity of bad money in circulation was a serious nuisance. Ultimately, the Sultan instituted a new customs branch staffed by expert money triers, which dealt solely with imported cash, and after this the amount of base money in circulation rapidly diminished. So this is an explanation and an example of how the barter system of the Ottoman Empire was taken over by cash commerce through currency. And then you also have the element explaining the devaluing of currency by mixing in bad money. That same thing happened here in the United States. Originally there was a trade barter system established with all the Indian nations and with the merchants, the uh, uh, various merchant classes, you know, you, you had the, the voyageurs that would go around and carry people's stuff on boats, basically the old truck drivers, and they had their own businesses and became vastly wealthy, whereas the truck drivers today are essentially slaves to the, the corporations that do this, and they get abused and mistreated in every way possible, <clears throat> unlike in the past when you had the voyageurs who basically made themselves trade empires, just like with the merchant republics. That is a huge problem for uh, globalist tyrants that want to uh, control everything. They can't have individuals being empowered and becoming um, a threat. Of course, in the United States, they had to do the same thing where this, they impose a corporate state which imposes bad money, counterfeit currency. And that way they can take over the region and devalue the economy and take control of everything. And it, was, it would have been done the exact same way that it was done with the Levant, because where you have a barter system, you have, it, it becomes, a, even though it has all of its drawbacks and all its issues, it's a lot harder to control than, say, counterfeit currency into a currency-based system. And so they would have done the same thing here in the United States that they did in the Levant. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content and my other channels. There are free books available at the links. And if you so choose, you may support my work at any of the options available. PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, Buy Me a Coffee, etc. Thank you.